Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to this book launch. Uh, so that's the book. Uh, so it actually did come out. Um, so I, I will be 15 minutes. Uh, and uh, then we'll turn this over to our commentator, Professor Tom Ginsberg. And uh, then the authors will have four minutes each. Uh, since we want to make this about 75 minutes, you know, if we go over maybe 90 minutes. Uh, so thanks for coming uh, to this book launch. Uh, it's actually very exciting. Um, this book has been many years in the making, and, and thanks to so many people, especially the authors, uh, for their wonderful chapters and for being patient over a couple of years. Thanks also to the series editors uh, of, of, of this wonderful series that has produced uh, these amazing books on international courts. Uh, thanks to also the OUP editors, Meryl Alstein, the senior commissioning editor, and Jack McNichol, with whom I work very uh, closely. And also thanks to Tom, who I'll introduce briefly uh, and who will be making remarks after me. So uh, I will be about uh, 14 minutes from now done. Uh, then Tom will come in and, and give his comments. And then, as I said, the uh, Chapter authors will say something briefly, four minutes each, uh, beginning with uh, Andrew uh, Henrik, uh, Obi, and Jake, uh, BC, Solomon, Victor, and uh, then Jacqueline, then Karen and Larry, and then Harrison Otieno. So why this book? This book covers all of Africa's international courts. Uh, and I won't, you know, sort of bore you. I think most people here I see know about these international courts. Um, and uh, in addition, uh, we, we have the, uh, so two unique things about, I, I think, this book in terms of bringing all the courts together. Uh, um, much of the literature in Africa, unfortunately, is divided between Anglophone and, and Francophone countries. And so uh, one of the things we tried to do was to bridge that gap by having the OHADA uh, um, uh, Common Court of Justice and Arbitration, as well as the SEMA Court of Justice. Uh, we also, in the last chapter of the book uh, with Harrison, we talked about the Arab Maghreb Union judicial organ uh, to reflect on why there is no judicialization in North Africa relative to other parts of Africa. Uh, so besides the fact that this book covers all of Africa's international courts, it centers, in my view, uh, the voices of uh, African authors. And I'm really delighted that these young African authors, the future of the scholarship in this area, are part of this book. Uh, the second theme is to displace the widespread pessimism about Africa's international courts. The two dominant approaches to using, to sort of uh, measuring the performance of Africa's international courts have been compliance and effectiveness. Um, I won't say much about these two approaches. Uh, there's a long introduction in the book. Uh, a major takeaway uh, from this book is that judicial decisions matter beyond compliance uh, and effectiveness. Uh, uh, these two approaches, and in particular compliance approaches uh, uh, that take quantitative measurements, uh, do not tell us uh, uh, about these international courts in the ways in which the various chapters in this book, uh, uh, this book uh, does uh, do. A primary reason for the misalignment between the roles of Africa's international courts, such as those described uh, by uh, the earlier scholarship, uh, is because, in my view, and this is my view, I don't want to attribute this to the authors, uh, um, much of this theoretical literature has been developed on the basis of European and developed country experiences. Uh, the fact that Africa's international courts serve roles other than those contemplated by these theories does not mean that these African international courts are flawed or indeed failures, but rather that they're independent, they're an independent and a legitimate type of legalization, which is what this book is about. Um, so, uh, this book argues that uh, uh, when litigants file cases in these courts, uh, they are doing so for a number of reasons that have been underemphasized in the literature. And in particular, uh, we, I just want to emphasize just one aspect of uh, what a lot of the chapters do, which is to look at uh, the role of political parties, especially, especially opposition political parties, uh, opposition politicians, uh, civil society groups uh, that uh, use these courts 
Um, and often these politicians uh, use these courts, use the litigation in these courts to give credibility to their opposition party claims uh, and a platform to campaign against dominant political parties to offer, uh, and therefore these cases offer a window in the type, to the types of electoral manipulation that dominant political parties in Africa engage in. Uh, the ability of litigants to uh, frame their causes of action um, as treaty breaches, especially in East and West Africa, is a major theme uh, of at least uh, three uh, chapters in the book, and you'll hear from the book chapters. Uh, the point here is that, as this book shows, uh, these courts are increasingly becoming additional leverage points for position politicians and parties in the ongoing democratization processes in these countries. Uh, this is particular so when one takes into account how opposition political parties and politicians are using these courts in their quest to structure an environment of open and free political competition, free and fair and free and fair elections in their countries. In other words, uh, to fully appreciate uh, this view of African International Court, this book shows it is mistaken to regard them as independent actors isolated from other sites of political, social, and legal contestation and change. Rather, as this book shows, uh, these courts are one option for activist and litigant litigation within a broader set of institutions, including domestic courts. So uh, what many chapters in this book emphasize, therefore, is that the aims of those filing uh, cases do not always include a desire to win or prevail, uh, since these cases are regarded as an additional leverage point uh, in their quest to build and maintain movements for open political competition. Uh, many of the chapters explore the strategies judges and lawyers follow to make these cases justiciable. Uh, and sort of there's a very interesting discussion uh, in many of uh, the chapters about this. Um, one of the uh, uh, two other points I want to emphasize, uh, since I want to hand this over to Tom soon, is that uh, I think this, what this book shows is that foregrounding compliance inaccurate, inaccurately presupposes litigation is being pursued in, that, in these non-European courts because, because litigants see them as primary change agents. Such an assumption is based on the experience of structural reform litigation uh, in North America and Latin America. This assumption is further fortified by theoretical priorities that are based on experiences that have no direct relevance to these non-European courts. Uh, so uh, these chapters, the chapters in the book show there is no assumption that the users of Africa's international courts uh, um, are, are sort of structural reformers, as I've already alluded to uh, before. Um, uh, I don't want to overemphasize this point, but I guess it's, it's important to say that, uh, that measuring Africa's international courts solely on compliance and effectiveness presupposes there is a universal set of benchmarks that must necessarily uh, uh, be the basis upon which to assess international courts everywhere. I personally, uh, James Gavi, don't agree with this, uh, uh, this assumption. Um, since compliance and effectiveness, effectiveness reflect the priorities and concerns uh, developed in academic circles in the West, where I teach uh, using this as the only measurements to establish the impact of international courts in Africa invariably marginalizes and trivializes the international law that these non-European courts produce. Uh, so this book, in my view, expands the aperture for examining the work of international courts uh, beyond those theoretical approaches that exist. And one of the ways that, the other ways the book does this is by foregrounding uh, what I call a thick description approach uh, uh, that, uh, we can talk about later on. Uh, I don't want to say much about that right now, but uh, to conclude, I think this book uh, represents um, a second generation of scholarship on Africa's international courts. I, I think the first generation of scholarship, in my view, was primarily looking at uh, uh, sort of the establishment of these courts and uh, the contributions they made, particularly in the human rights arena, uh, a largely sort of uh, quite uh, doctrinal in the emphasis. Uh, this book takes uh, the scholarship uh, a step further through in-depth case studies 
of how litigation impacts political, legal, social mobilization. Um, and, and so uh, I'm really delighted that uh, the authors were patient over several years to uh, produce this volume. It was not entirely clear at the beginning uh, that this volume would come together when we first met in Chicago many years ago. Um, and uh, so I'm now delighted to turn this over uh, to Tom Ginsberg, who is a professor of law at the University of Chicago and uh, many things great. So Tom, welcome. Thank you so much, James, for inviting me here. And thank you for producing this book. It's a fantastic uh, volume. And I actually think it's something that every international lawyer should own. I consider it kind of like a, a Bible or a reference point for these courts uh, because each one of them is described with great detail, great legal detail. And it takes kind of the right approach in that it's not uh, formalistically legal, but sort of integrates very detailed, rich studies of the law you know, and that's why I say it's a good reference work, but also um, obviously taking into account, you know, fundamental and I would say universal political questions uh, and, and uh, about how courts get up and running, how courts um, work in some sense, how courts function, I guess I should say. Um, so I thought what I would do is just briefly say, talk a little bit about this compliance effectiveness and what, you know, sort of what the theoretical takeaway is from the various chapters, um, and uh, I'll start with that. So, you know, and I think it may be helpful for those people who haven't read the book, obviously, or maybe you're outside the literature. You know, if you think about, you know, very basic thing, states want to do something together, they set up a court to do it, and then the court starts acting, and so the natural question is, well, is it, a, you know, how does it work? Is it, have those decisions been complied with? And fairly early on, and this is true even of domestic courts, you know, we kind of realize that, that that very simple framework, which I don't think is something to be rejected, but it just doesn't capture, you know, court, whether courts make a difference. And this is where the idea of effectiveness came into kind of stand out and say, are we, um, are the courts changing behavior? And this volume, of course, as James has said, is uh, sort of rejects that frame. Now, the word on the cover is the performance of the courts, but I think it's something sort of deeper than that. It's basically looking at how these institutions have changed the social space. And it's really a two-way interaction. Uh, the direction of institutional change is both from the society, the civil society actors, the bureaucracies, the state actors who wanted to create these courts, uh, and the, um, you know, and the civil society people out there the litigants, the people who've suffered various abuses, and the businessmen, all kinds of folks have kind of interacted. And I think the big point of the book is that it's, I like this metaphor that Kim Lane Shepley uses. It's something like a two-level chessboard, you know. People are playing in their own national level, but then there's this other level up above. Uh, and, of course, one could go even higher and say there's general international law. But, you know, each of these regional institutions is its own um, – uh, board on which one can make moves. And those moves you can make are set up by the legal structure. What we see is that the addition of these levels has changed the game and changed the game at both levels. And I think it's really um, uh, interesting and important. Actually, when you look at my main concern these days, which is the role of courts in sort of carving out some space for democratic action, you know, I think that these courts that are covered in this volume, you know, despite all the challenges, despite the state backlashes, uh, we'll hear about one of the chapters, actually have done a better job than the European Court of Justice, uh, or even maybe even the Inter-American Court, much older bodies. Now, in the life cycle, these are much younger institutions, and obviously, you know, a very challenging environment for democracy in Africa. And yet, uh, I think we'll look back and say, you know, this actually was a really important venue by expanding that that level of the chessboard. Um, and it's also a point of how poorly the other courts have done. You know, and the, the big example is that in Europe, you know, they now have, you know, one non-democracy in the middle of the European Union and one which is heading that direction. And the courts in the European Union wasn't able to stop that. So um, I think uh, the, the contributions are empirical, the contributions are theoretical and uh, comparative, and I just think it's a, it's a terrific volume. We have, now, I know we're supposed to hear from all the chapter authors, so maybe I should stop there and turn it back to BC, because I want to make sure we have time for everyone to, uh, to talk and maybe um, discussion at the end. So with that short,
comment. I'll turn it back to James, I guess, in the BC. Uh, thanks, Tom, for, for those generous comments. Um, suddenly, I, I think uh, that, uh, you know, we're not saying that this is the greatest volume, uh, so we, we, we're also looking forward to the discussion um, uh, mm -hmm. later on so that we can get those hard questions. So is Andrew, Andrew uh, uh, Henrich uh, here? Yes, I am, James. Oh, excellent. Andrew, good, good, good. Yes, I see you on the screen. Your four minutes begins. And tell us your chapter because I didn't introduce anybody's chapter. <laughs> sure, absolutely. So thank you so much, James, first of all, for including me on this and for uh, your wonderful words this morning and your stewardship of this volume uh, over the years um, and on a really important project. Um, at the outset, I'd also like to thank Sarah Desilet for her incredibly invaluable contributions to uh, to my way of thinking uh, as, as an incredible sociologist and who introduced me to Ibawa's uh, flow and counterflow concept to begin with. Um, one of James's greatest innovations of many, surely, in this, in this book, I think, is, is found in the title where he talks about using uh, these courts. And I think that the idea of giving so much agency to the litigators is at the center of this chapter. Uh, this chapter asks, our, asks, you know, I ask myself, uh, what is uh, the EACJ doing to contribute to transitional justice in Burundi? And um, I thought of it much like James did, especially as I dug into the EACJ case law, as really what was it being used for? What was the EACJ being used for? By whom? With what mechanisms? Towards what end? And I think I'll just briefly discuss my chapter in order of answering those questions. So um, for what purpose are these litigants uh, using the EACJ to advance transitional justice in Burundi? Well, they're using it as the replacement uh, space for transitional justice that the domestic uh, environment does not afford them. And there are so many reasons for that. Obviously, the chronic human rights abuses, obviously the lack of sufficient venue and jurisdiction domestically, um, but also the, the suffocation of Burundian civil society. And much of what you'll see when we talk about the by whom is that the functions of Burundian civil society are slowly migrating or flowing, in Ibowo's words, to the EACJ. Um, so, yes, the uh, EACJ is being used by, by these litigants in the most traditional senses of, of transitional justice to enhance rule of law, to aim towards accountability. I think a lot of the uh, property takings cases that I speak of in the chapter speak to that quite well. But I also think that there's a third piece, um, which is, as I alluded to earlier, the replacement of civil society and the more abstract forms of transitional justice that are thought about so frequently. And the reason I say that is um, I particularly sought to address those who might criticize the Burundian case law in the EACJ, where the EACJ's greatest intervention is simply to say that they found that they had jurisdiction um, and then to say that the case wasn't right. And this was a move that the EACJ does all the time. And um, I think that it's very tempting to say that that's kind of a, a do-nothing result, you know, to say that we're going to find over and over again in all these takings cases that we have or in the, in the quartering of soldiers' cases that we have jurisdiction just to find that it's not ripe. Quite to the contrary, you know, the more um, modern transitional justice literature, the more comprehensive transitional justice literature, finds space for that in the transitional justice movement. Um, that recognition of violence and recognition of loss and recognition that there is a justiciable harm is itself a very important modality of transitional justice. So that's what it is being used for, the EACJ, in the transitional justice movement in Burundi. The next question is by whom? And, and if you have the book in front of you, I think that the, uh, and I thank the editors at OUP for this, the, the table on page 102 can be really helpful in breaking down the three types of litigants I identified. The first is the repeat players. Um, I, again, I thank Sarah Desilet for, for really encouraging me to think, as, as Tom Ginsburg already, already said, about the uh, non-formalistic parts of the law, uh, of the case law that's so important. Uh, there are about three or four litigators, many of us know their names anyway, um, who are showing up again and again and again in Burundian case law, um, often on cases where they already were told that there was jurisdiction but the issue wasn't ripe. But the the idea is they, they have this goal of, of pursuing individual justice for the individuals they're seeking. It's typically property and contracts cases. But really what I think it most importantly uh, uh, steps, uh, you know, makes clear is that this is a truth-telling mechanism uh, for transitional justice for these repeat players. It's about getting the, the stories of these individuals on the record in a formal court of law um, with 
um, recognition beyond Burundi. Second, uh, as is often the case in a lot of these regional courts, it's a political forum for, for opposition parties. Um, there are very obvious reasons why the domestic political format, format doesn't allow for that. So political opposition finds their way to the EACJ frequently. Finally, it's the NGOs who seek to find a space for civil society. Um, these are typically election and constitutional issues. But what I'd like to do so, so that we can understand the how of how these actors use this space is to think about the Igbo well flow counterflow concept. So uh, Tom Ginsburg, who, by the way, is a, a former teacher of mine uh, from law school, so it's great to see him again, um, talked in his moments about, in his comments about the two-way movement. And, and Igbo Wo's flow counterflow concept is the same concept with a different name. It's the idea that there's a flow of certain um, matters and certain concepts from Burundi to, up to the EACJ, and then a certain counterflow of ideas. And, and I think the flow that we see to the EACJ most obviously is jurisdiction and venue, obviously, is probably, though, also a sense of political activism and venue. I think in a lot of the political opposition and NGO cases in particular, you see the EACJ replacing the public forum uh, of Burundi and, and being that public forum. And then finally, I think it replaces the function of civil society in some ways, or it's at least the flow of civil society, where obviously over the last seven or eight years in particular, this has been particularly difficult for NGOs to find in Burundi, and the EACJ has become that venue for them. The counterflow, I think, is all of the transitional justice mechanisms, both the most um, conventional ones and, and some of the more abstract ones that I think are most important in Burundi, uh, ranging from, like I said, accountability, rule of law, to truth-telling, recognition of victimhood, and so forth. Um, the final question uh, I'll just briefly answer is, to what end? Um, and, and I've alluded to this briefly, uh, but I think that, you know, it's again, it's tempting to say, well, nothing's really been accomplished in these cases. Um, and I think quite to the contrary, it has. Um, I think it's, it's I actually, uh, in a conversation with one of the NGO litigants, uh, after I'd finished the first draft of this chapter, uh, I said something like, you know, you know what the court's going to say. They're going to find that they have jurisdiction. So fighting this issue from Article 25 probably won't get you very far, you, you, or rather you will get far. You, there's Nothing will change. And then you'll know what happens on ripeness as well. Um, and he said, but, it, you know, at least someone's listening this way. And, and someone's listening, most importantly, who writes down that they listened. And that, that shouldn't be undervalued. Um, so I'll just conclude with, with James's uh, rejection of pessimism. I find this as an optimistic chapter. I think it's it's uh, an extraordinary statement that the EACJ has been able to replace um, a, a otherwise, or at least allow for an outward flow of an otherwise silent political opposition and um, civil society space domestically in Burundi, uh, has given repeat players the chance for folks to have their victimhood identified and, and truth-telling be told in a venue where you know it will be documented. Uh, and I think it, it is definitely something that we can think about as uh, regional courts uh, playing a role beyond their formalistic judicial function uh, in the transitional justice process. So with that, I, I thank you, James, once again, uh, for the opportunity to be included amongst these other wonderful authors and, and on this important work. And I, I return the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you. So Andrew's uh, chapter is called Subregional Courts as Transitional Justice Mechanisms, the case of the East African Court of Justice in Burundi. Next uh, is uh, Ubiero Kafor and Jake Efudo. Uh, the ECOWAS court as a promising resource for pro poor activist forces, sovereign hurdles, brainy relays, and flipped strategic social constructi constructivism. Uh, your four minutes starts now. Obi looks like you're. Can you, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh my. Yes, yes we can hear you. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I'd just like to begin by, by thanking James for his uh, leadership in uh, persevering and putting together this volume over many moons, as we say in Nigeria. Uh, it's been long in the making, but the product has been fabulous, uh, in my view. Uh, it tackles, as a volume, a significantly under-researched uh, area and deals with it in a, uh, in a relatively novel way, I would say. Um, so as James and others who have spoken uh, before have pointed out, the broad sort of overarching 
takeaway is that <coughs> we need to move way beyond mere compliance as a framework for assessing or measuring the value uh, of these courts. Uh, I think that's the overarching thing. So there are various ways in which that you know uh, can be appreciated. I think that's uh, um, uh, the the overarching takeaway with which I I agree. I've agreed for a long time with our James James notes. Um, uh, others have made this point as well, so it's not entirely uh, new. Um, <clears throat> But certainly new uh, significantly with regard to how Africa's courts uh, are viewed, even even by African activists, some African activists at times, right? At least authors, those who who have written. Um, so so for our part, and and Jake and Jake would say a few things, uh, but very quickly, uh, Jake and I, Jake, if we do. Um, the chapter on the Coast Court merges our interest in, in that court, other courts as well, um, quasi-judicial bodies, and sort of the uh, defense of the human rights of Africa's subalterns, to put it uh, that way. Uh, it builds on my own previous work uh, in a 2007 book uh, on, again, beyond map state compliance in assessing uh, the value of the African human rights system to state and society, or states and societies uh, in Africa. Uh, the key, uh, as I urged in that book, is to look at what local actors actually did. And the inspiration actually was from my practice as a young human rights lawyer. So it wasn't actually an insight that came from me thinking. It was actually an insight that came from me actually doing that. So using the African uh, system, the normative instruments, the African Commission at the time, there was no court, uh, within the Nigerian system, within a military system, and actually getting results within a total, you know, authoritarian uh, regime. Um, so, so it builds on that. Um, and, and of course, the, the, the question that, uh, the broad question we're asking that, chapter, which is preliminary to some of the other work that, that we'll soon publish, hopefully, is how, ca how can, how can these, what is this promise? How can they be, uh, that court be used, the ECOWAS court, uh, by analogy, other similarly situated courts be used, uh, or sorry, be, um, uh, how can it serve as a valuable resource, right? I like that word, a resource, uh, in the minds and hands of local activists on the continent, in this case in West Africa, or at least in the ECOWAS region. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, like I said, we have moved to to uh, now uh, authoring a series of papers which we haven't uh, published yet, but will soon uh, uh, send out um, on how it has actually done that, right, in different contexts: legislative, executive. Uh, judicial. Uh, this is the ECOWAS court, of course, using one one country, uh, the most important African country. James would agree, Nigeria, as the as the case study. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm going to start at East West War here. Anyway, um, the, the, so so the court and its constitutive instruments, if you like, uh, have, in our view, and this is where I'll end quickly, provided an enhanced. Uh, oh, sorry, and to an extent enhanced a repertoire of normative resources that agents, local agents, use in various ways. And it's almost like a virus. It continues to change. It's never always in the same way, right? And so through the cases that we discover, you see a range of various ways, all beyond compliance. In the interviews, none of these activists ever thought that they were just going to get a decision and, you know, the, even the so-called democratic government would just comply. You know, they're not, they're not that naive. So I, I, I'll end there and if there's, I, I hope there's some time for James to say a few words. I talk too much sometimes. Jake, uh, you, you're, you're lucky that uh, Obi did not start that four-minute war. So uh, <laughs> you have the remaining 30 seconds of the four minutes. 
Anyways, I just want, Professor Kafo has said everything. I want to thank you, Professor James Gatti. And uh, this chapter, I'm actually privileged to be uh, to be listed here with Professor Kafo. This builds on the many years and even decade of work he's been doing uh, around the ECOWAS course and also influenced by really great writings of Ebrobra, uh, Gatti, and even Professor Alta here. Um, if I could just add anything to what Prof has said, it is that what we explored in this chapter is pretty much um, a part of Professor Kappa's work, but also my, my LLM, my master's at Osgoodhall Law School, was also focused on the ECOWAS court, um, which has served as a, you know, a resource for pro-poor activists who have used the instruments of the court to advance you know, pro-poor causes. So when we looked at this chapter, we're looking at pretty much the extent that which the ECOWAS court has been normatively and procedurally equipping or arming domestic activist forces within West Africa, and of course their foreign allies as well, and to the extent that these activists have co-created or co-enhanced the very norms and procedures with which they've been armed or given. Um, also, this chapter also demonstrates that, you know, significantly useful that this court has been in terms of proper activist struggles. The court has been in terms of its uh, valuable normative and procedural resource, also has certain sovereign hurdles or significant gaps that exist in this pro uh repertoire, you know, of resources and contributions. So we do definitely highlight the value of the court and how it has sort of pushed the ball or advanced the struggles of activist forces, including the, the normative framework of what we classify as human rights within West Africa. But also we, you know, we find that there are certain areas, you know, for improvement that the ECOWAS court can build up in terms of optimizing its promise as a resource for proper activists and as a promise for, for human rights um, within the region. So thank you very much. Congratulations, Professor James. I'm really excited about this. I can't wait to um, hold the physical copy. Again, I know we're all in the digital world where we can read things online, but I still want to hold the book in paper. So congrats and thank you so much for the opportunity and the privilege, Prof. Thank you. Thanks, Jake. Um, I'll keep the checks coming. Uh, so the next person on the uh, line is Professor uh, Akinkube Olabisi Akinkube. I've never heard of this name. His chapter is Towards an Analysis of the Mega Political Jurisprudence of the ECOWAS Court of Justice. Your four minutes starts now. Okay, uh, nice to meet you, Professor Gathi. Uh, uh, echo everyone else's uh, thanks to you for your leadership on this project. Uh, my own uh, reflection in the, in the four minutes really takes me back to 2016 when we met. And it's interesting because as you started speaking, I dug out my then draft uh, chapter, uh, which the title uh, read National Impact and Enforcement of Decisions of Africa's International Courts and African Charter Norms. Uh, I thought to look back a little bit because uh, I had challenge, uh, uh, a huge one, writing that chapter in the form it was conceptualized uh, at that time. Uh, the feedback from that workshop was very helpful, but it immediately also revealed that uh, perhaps speaking of this court in the language of impact, uh, amongst others, uh, really uh, attempts to force them uh, in a pipeline that really cannot take them. Uh, and I think that's where this book emerges, to say let's either expand uh, or reimagine how we uh, understand these courts, not based on conceptualizations uh, of individuals, uh, but perhaps writing its practice uh, in, the, in the narrative. And I think uh, that's what Professor Kiafokafo has, has alluded to, to say, uh, look, my understanding of this court comes from my practice. So that's where my own chapter also emerges, to try to, not from my practice, uh, but from what others have uh, have really also done, think about how the disputes uh, that really emerging out of essentially national electoral processes uh, that end up in the regional courts, uh, what they mean uh, for, for the parties, uh, what they mean for the courts, uh, what they mean for the states. Uh, from that point of view, my chapter really carries on one of the central themes of the book, 
uh, this expansion of the notion of effectiveness and, if you like, deconstructing its limitations. But I think one uh, quote from one of the cases, uh, it's the Hope Democratic Party's case, uh, really shows the, the importance uh, of the mega political jurisprudence uh, uh, of these cases, of the courts. Uh, when the council, you know, was asked by the court uh, that the case before the court now uh, is more or less useless uh, because the events in Nigeria has moved past uh, that with a new administration, his response to the court was, quote, uh, we wanted ECOWAS community court to rule on this issue so as to serve as a deterrent to other would-be violators of the elections law on fairness and equality before the law. Uh, couched in very legal formalist terms, it might appear, uh, but it goes to the uses they do of these cases uh, in their mega political context in the sense that at the heart of a lot of these disputes, uh, some of which I discuss in my uh, chapter, uh, really is an attempt to continue to uh, deepen the roots of democratic governance, uh, legal reforms, uh, and to put at the heart of really uh, some of the national contestations issues that the litigants feel that national courts have more or less closed the door uh, on them to litigate effectively. Uh, so that's one way in which my own chapter tries to, to show these as part of a broader effort uh, at ensuring, uh, you know, democratic entrenchment in these countries, uh, not in the sense of formal compliance at all, uh, naming and shaming and, and you know, uh, activation of human rights discourses. And as, as I close, uh, I think this particular way of using the courts uh, as events of the past few months from the African court, uh, human and people's rights have shown, is not limited to that. Uh, something I've reflected on in a forthcoming piece is the, is the decision from the African court uh, on human and people's rights decision from Benin, uh, the Hongo's case, uh, which is another way in which we see these, if you like, quote unquote, norms uh, gradually spreading uh, across the African continent. And so uh, my own chapter essentially does that uh, and shows that the, the, the activities of this court and, and on this our end, uh, which is why I also like what the book did, uh, did not try to quote and unquote, reconceptualize the courts by naming them something. Otherwise we are in this you know, universe where we're constantly constantly renaming the courts. It's now human rights courts. It's now election cases courts. It's now, it's now criminal justice courts. Uh, it just shows the variety uh, of the cases that come before these courts and the focus should not be limited, even though I think it should be included uh, in the traditional functions of courts and how the judicians uh, uh, are utilized. So thanks a lot, uh, James. Uh, and thank you very much to, to Professor Helfer and Alta who uh, helped in the uh, francophone cases that informed this chapter. Uh, thanks, BC. Um, great. Uh, so uh, the next uh, chapter is co-authored by Som Solomon Ebobra, who's been writing about Africans international courts uh, for longer than uh, anybody else I know, and Victor Lando, uh, who is... Uh, uh, legal practitioner in Kenya, and, and I was delighted to be his uh, external reader for his PhD a couple of years ago. Uh, um, and the chapter is titled Africa's Aboriginal Courts as Backup Custodians of Constitutional Justice Beyond the Compliance Question. Victor, I see you on the line. Uh, do you want to take the four minutes? Yes. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I should be saying a happy new year to all of us. Uh, Professor Gade, it's a pleasure to uh, see you this year. I've also had the pleasure of meeting uh, Professor Okafor, uh, who we have been doing some work uh, on a separate uh, matter related to the African continent as well. I've also seen uh, Professor Karen Alter and uh, Helfer. I have seen your books and your articles. I've uh, cited you several in things that I've written, so it's very good to put a face to the name. Um, the, the chapter that we, we worked on with uh, Professor Ebobra 
um, basically build on uh, the other chapters that, uh, or, the, or the other chapters that have been uh, discussed earlier. And majorly, we're looking at um, assessing the impact of the. Uh, we're focused on the on the East African Court of Justice, as well as the ECOWAS Court. And 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 we're looking at. Um, uh, you know, we build on uh, Professor Okafor's argument that compliance uh, or impact is more than just uh, the formal compliance with court decisions that lawyers are, you know, I'm not saying addicted to, but our default setting as lawyers is that when a court uh, gives a decision, then the judgment of the court must be obeyed. And we measure the impact based on that. But then when you look at uh, Professor Okafor's um, writings, as well as uh, several writings that uh, Professor Gadi has also done, uh, the, uh, there is um, an emerging, an emerging uh, you know, uh, reality that the impact of Africa's sub-regional courts uh, goes well beyond judgment compliance. You know, and so in our chapter, we were saying that uh, uh, when you look at the ECOWAS court and you look at the East African Court of Justice, Sorry, those are my dogs making noise. Uh, when you look at the ESCJ and the ECOWAS court, uh, their decisions um, and the litigation processes actually in those courts go well beyond just um, impact by judgment compliance. So for example, a very good example is where you have uh, cross uh, jurisdictional sort of um, collaboration between civil society when a, a matter pertaining, for example, to human rights is raised. Uh, a re very recent example is a case that I am involved in uh, at the East African Court of Justice. It was recently filed. Now, it was filed by organizations, CS, CSOs in Kenya and Uganda, based on the recently concluded elections in Tanzania. And there is a claim that uh, the then incumbent was using their position to uh, you know, not disenfranchised, but to influence the election outcome in their favor. And, and so you find that CSOs in Kenya and Uganda have filed a matter before the ESCJ pertaining to the situation in Tanzania. And, and, and we can see that uh, there was also the one for, there was a Burundi case, the, the, the Rugumba case, for example, in Burundi, where the person who filed the suit was actually not in Burundi as at that time. So there's, there's a lot of CSO collaborations that happen. Uh, so that is one of the ways in which you can assess the impact of the decisions of the ESCJ. Another one is, for example, looking at the way the ESCJ and the ECOWAS court collaborates uh, with national courts. Uh, and I think it goes back to what uh, Professor Ginsburg had, uh, had, had mentioned and Andrew also had mentioned on the flow and the communications between the sub-regional uh, courts and the national courts, uh, such that we find when you do a very in-depth analysis of, of the decisions of the East African Court of Justice, there are some of them that have been cited with approval by national courts. So again, uh, beyond just mere judgment compliance, you find that there are certain decisions of the ESCJ, for example, that are then used and cited with approval by national courts and also vice versa you find that there are some decisions of national courts that are cited before the eacj the eacj being an international court of course is not bound by the rules of precedent but again those decisions uh, they influence the reasoning of the judges and the, the outcome of the decisions of of, of these courts and of course there is also a question of the filing of cases, the litigation process itself brings to the fore the discussion of the pertinent uh, human rights concerns majorly uh, that surround the sub-region. And a good example that I'll give would be when there was the Kampala bombings uh, sometime in the, I think it was 2008, 2009 or, or thereabout. I can't really get the exact dates, but there was a time when there were uh, bombings that of, of, of football matches or rugby matches, uh, people are watching rugby in Uganda. And there was a lot of renditions because the intelligence people discovered that there were some suspects who had come to Kenya, to Tanzania. And so there was a lot of renditions that happened to Uganda to have those people arrested and arraigned before court. And they were subjected to 
a lot of uh, torture and stuff like that. And, and you find that the litigation that happened at the national level eventually went before the East African Court of Justice. And that litigation process, of course, brought to the fore the whole question of what is the fate of human rights in the war against terror. You know, so those pertinent human rights concerns subregionally uh, came to the fore because of the litigation processes uh, at the East African Court of Justice. And so that is just a snapshot of what we look at in, 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 our, in, our, in, in our chapter. And uh, so basically, in conclusion, it just builds on the previous chapters that uh, the other previous authors have, have, have talked about, uh, that subregional courts, uh, again, we are not pessimistic. We are saying that when, uh, when you go to the default setting of lawyers where we assess compliance uh, or impact by the number of uh, cases or the number of decisions that have been fully complied with to the letter, that compliance goes well beyond that, that there are certain indirect impacts that actually contributes to what we call constitutional justice uh, in the sub-region. So uh, thank you very much again, Professor Gadi, for putting together this and for everyone else who took their time and effort to just uh, to, to uh, do this project. And I would be uh, maybe calling upon Professor Gadi again to uh, do another such project to be very, very glad to collaborate with you on that. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Victor. Victor, you're a very good lawyer. I see you're preempting me. I mean, where's the book? You know, that thesis has to be turned into a book. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm not letting you go off on that. I mean, uh, so Victor's thesis was excellent, really, especially on the indirect impact uh, of these courts. Uh, and as an external examiner, I learned a lot from his thesis. So I do honestly hope, Victor, you publish. I'm taking what you're telling me as uh, sort of you preempting me from saying what I'm saying. Anyway, uh, I think we have to go on. You've got to publish that book. Everybody here is going to be looking for it now. <laughs> okay, so uh, the next chapter is co-authored with uh, Jacqueline uh, Wangoi Mwangi, who is an SJD student at Harvard Law School, one of our rising stars, uh, the African Court of Human and People's Rights as an Opportunity Structure. So Jacqueline. Um, thank you, Professor Gadi. Um, I must also appreciate uh, you for including me in this project. We began slightly later than the other authors. So, and I remember at the time I had just completed my master's. So to me, it was such a, a privilege and as well, it provided an opportunity for mentorship in this, in, this, um, in, the, in, the, in the academia. So, our chapter is titled the African Court on Human and People's Rights as an Opportunity Structure, and it adopts a user-centered analysis to reassess the performance of the court, just as the introduction um, 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 talked about. So in this chapter, we argue that the African Court has created a political opening for advocacy litigants namely civil society organizations and opposition politicians who have grievances against their governments and that these litigants approach the court with a number of aims that are not strictly limited to um, winning cases. So this is a story that we've had from all the authors so far. So our analysis and our contribution to this volume is centered on two basic premises. Um, one being that rules governing access to courts have a great influence on the extent to which litigants will opt to advance their causes in courts. And number two, that context matters. Um, and by that, we mean that the imbalance of political power in many, Africa's, in many of Africa's authoritarian regimes makes international courts a very attractive avenue for litigants to challenge their governments in ways that they didn't anticipate. So, this idea of, the Africa, of, of a favorable, favorable opportunity structure is what we examine in the chapter. And it's, it's just, it's impressive to see the judicial gymnastics that the African court um, just undertakes. And I'll be able to explain this a little later. So the, 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 the court initially dealt with 
fair trial violations cases, which didn't appear to be very you know, politically charged. But the court took up that opportunity to build a very favorable jurisprudence that created um, uh, you know, like a setting for more highly you know, charged politically cases. So we show that the court's very permissive approach to issues like jurisdiction, legal standing, and rules on who bears the cost of litigation um, has created a body of law that provided an opportunity for filing of similar cases. So I'm not able to delve into this jurisprudence deeply, but there are a few specific things that I'd like to mention. So first, the court has no specific requirements as to the form of applications or pleadings, um, the form that pleadings should take. Handwritten petitions are allowed. Um, another thing is that the court has a very favorable interpretation of the requirement that applicants must exhaust local remedies. And this is where I really found it exciting to read and study judicial gymnastics. So um, the court's innovation has been to distinguish between ordinary and extraordinary uh, remedies in a given judicial, uh, in a given legal system. So finding that ordinary remedies are the usual or normally thought about remedies, while extraordinary remedies are the uncommon and those exceptionally sought um, remedies. So in the case of Tanzania, where most of these fair trial violations cases emanate, the court has observed that proceedings at the high courts and at the court of appeal are ordinary remedies while constitutional petitions and applications for review are extraordinary remedies because they're not available to all as of right within the Tanzanian dispute resolution system. So I guess this analysis would differ based on the, on the jurisdiction, but it's, it's just very impressive to you know that distinction to me was, and was extremely impressive. So equally important is the court's response to arguments against its jurisdiction in cases arising from national criminal um, convictions, which is the basic argument that governments um, present to the court. So like other international courts presented with this question, uh, the African court has maintained that its jurisdiction to examine the procedure followed by national courts is not an exercise of appeal over jurisdiction of a national court, but it's a matter separate and apart from, from domestic decisions. And it's, it's very striking to note that these permissive rules are not in the court's formal um, rules but rather they result from the judge's wide-ranging discretion to lower barriers for filing cases at the court. But this is just one part of the story. So this, a second and an equally critical part of this story is that the court's permissive jurisprudence in these fairly non-contentious cases has set the pace for future disputes by civil society groups and opposition parties closed off from pursuing their goals of political reform under national law and through national institutions. And I'm talking, um, I'm talking about um, the cases that we've seen uh, to present to the African court by politicians, whether it's in Rwanda, in Tanzania, in um, Cote d'Ivoire. Those are we focus on those three countries, but um, we want to show that. This, this um, idea of a favorable legal structure, as much as it's, it emanates from very high, in contentious cases on fair trial violations of prisoners, has had immense impact on, um, on uh, politics and democracy within the African continent. So, I'm going to, to just touch on one of the three cases that we consider because of time. And um, uh, this is the case of Victor Ingabire Umuhoza, widely, widely known case. Um, so Ingabire was an opposition leader that was charged under the Rwandis statute for the offense of minimalization of genocide. And this case and the others that we discuss shows that the value of litigating in the African courts 
lies elsewhere besides its jurisprudence. It provides an opportunity to make repressive governments accountable in forums they don't control. It brings international attention to the plight of political prisoners. And it also helps these politicians and um, civil society groups keep their stories on air. You know, it's very important for an activist um, that their story be heard uh, as widely as possible. So the African court was particularly uh, important in this case because it kept Ingabire's case in the news, but also, pre also um, made sure that her case was considered by the European Parliament, by international organizations at the UN, eventually leading to her release. So this is just such a clear case that effectiveness of courts is not a formalistic, um, should never be judged on a formalistic tangent, yeah. So this user-centered analysis definitely will bring us to a better understanding of what success looks like, because it's not judged on, uh, on the courts um, per se, but it's really judged on what the user and an actor is seeking in these courts. And it's definitely touches on what Andrew uh, talked about, repeat players and why they keep going to court. Yeah, so I will, I will leave it at that. And unless I left anything out that James would want to add, but yeah, that's where I would leave it. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Jacqueline. Uh, I, I don't really have anything to add. Uh, that was a great summary. Uh, uh, I guess you're going to tell us Bobby Wine is going to be the next lit litigant in the ESCJ. <laughs> uh, but um, so uh, the next uh, chapter is co-authored with uh, my uh, other two very good friends who I have a lot of respect for. We've traveled to Africa with them uh, and both have been generous. In a sense, I guess, uh, Karen, I would say this chapter began on a soccer field, a long story for another day. Um, uh, so, uh, Karen Alter and Larry Helper, two of my very good friends, have a lot of respect for them for sort of being very open to debate with me every premise of everything international law. So, um, our four minutes begin now, but mine are over. Okay, I want to, uh, Larry's asked me to take the lead on the talking, and I want to mention one other scholar who contributed to this article, but he's unmentioned, is a wonderful Ethiopian scholar, Miratab Tsinite, who came with us on the field work um, when he was a PhD student. So uh, we wrote this chapter as a separate project, and then we came to the, the conference. We're happy to, to expand uh, or return some material in the book format, some of the detail of the backlashes in each of the three cases that we could put in the book, but not in the article. And we are happy to come to the conference and, and be part of the incubation of this project. Speaking for myself, although I'm sure Larry would agree, uh, it's, it's really interesting how, how one takes the idea of beyond compliance and effectiveness when you turn it over to African scholars to debate how we see new insights. As Tom Ginsburg noted, many people have talked about how compliance and effectiveness are incomplete ideas. But when you really start to see African scholars take them out and say, well, then what? I think this book answers really powerfully the question, then in what other ways do we want to go to see the impact of courts? I think our chapter shows that African courts can be a real laboratory for theoretical innovation because they present some wonderful similarities and variations. So in our chapter, we look at three efforts concrete efforts to neuter internet African courts, all triggered by a decision that really angered a government, where the government then went after the court. And what we look at are the actors who then come and mobilize to defend the court. And we compare these three backlashes and see how, uh, to, to summarize two of the main findings, we see one is the role of secretariats and parliaments in organizing to defend these courts. Of course, the bar associations are also very organized, but to the extent that they're led into the process and the process is slowed down for civil society to be able to participate in the process, it's really the secretariats and the parliaments who create these kind of access points. And here they have agency to do that. And we saw that in ECOWAS where the backlash failed entirely, it was because the secretariat slowed down the process and opened it to civil society groups. The backlash happened so swiftly in East Africa, and it was through all these extra legal mechanisms, it, and it happened in about three weeks. 
if they had been able to slow it down, maybe the outcome would have been a little bit different. But in any event, the Secretariat also wasn't as interested in slowing it down. And in SADC, they did slow it down, not because the Secretary necessarily wanted to, but um, because Zimbabwe tried multiple, multiple times to get an affirmative support for its idea to dismantle the court. And it never once succeeded in getting sufficient affirmative support. And so the second general finding is about how the appointment rules really led to the success of the SADC backlash. And this is also generalizable because we see this is exactly what's happened in the WTO context, where SADC did not have um, a way to replace, to force the replacement of judges. Whereas in ECOWAS, the judges stay on until they're replaced. And there have been times when it's taken so long to replace judges that the entire bench is turned over at the same time. In SADC, you couldn't force them to replace the judges. And basically, Zimbabwe ran out the clock, just as happened in the WTO and made the, and made the board ineffective. I want to stop here. I've used three and a half minutes. But to say that those are the... the it's a wonderful laboratory to study African courts and to theorize. Larry, did you want to add anything, or James? I don't. I don't have anything to add other than uh, my congratulations for James for putting this all together. I think it's a superb collection. Thank you. Um, that was really African time, people. <laughs> <laughs> Larry, are sure you don't have anything else to add? No. The only thing, I guess, one sentence is, um, you know. The unintended consequences of design choices where the those who were negotiating the treaties may not have known this business about the judges and the, the, the uh, holdover rules or the lack thereof, uh, obviously a huge thing in the WTO. Uh, I would venture to say that most negotiators probably, I don't know, I can't speak for the WTO, but I would be very surprised if that was a point of real discussion among the uh, government representatives, but it, made, it makes a huge difference when it comes time to pressure the court going forward. And Mugabe was, as uh, has the United States and the WTO, been really uh, effective in uh, using the default setting of running out the clock to neuter the, the tribunals. Well, if I can add one, one thing that I want to say is that we did actually research business group mobilization to see if these would be allies of the court. We did interviews both in the ECOWAS context and, and for this research project. And for various reasons, they're not willing to, to either really actively engage with the court or to mobilize to defend the court. So they're fair what, not even fair weather friends of these African regional courts, which I find really, really interesting and worthy of further research. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think this chapter is a uh, a good example of the costs. It's not just a story of uh, up and up. Uh, I think there the, the are costs to judicializing a lot of the political disputes, the election disputes, and, and I think this chapter shows the the, the variation in outcomes uh, depending on all those factors that uh, both Karen Alt and, and, and Larry pointed out. Speaking of business groups not willing to engage the courts, I'm delighted to introduce Harrison. Where is Harrison? from here. Oh, you're here. Oh, you're hidden by my chat. I thought you did one of those disappearing acts, which you're famous for. No. Uh, <laughs> so here we go. Harrison, SJD candidate at a place called Loyola University, Chicago, uh, also was coached to a WTO moot uh, winning team at the global level. They beat Harvard a few years ago. So um, he knows quite a bit about WTO economic cases, I guess. That's why his chapter has, uh, I, I guess I want you to say something also about uh, your contribution to the African Journal of International Economic Law, which dealt with that part of, you know, why business cases. So you have one, one minute for that and three minutes for your chapter in this book. Okay. Um, uh, thank you so much, Prof. Gadi, and for all the other authors who have uh, spoken uh, before, um, as I stated, I'm an SJD candidate at Loyola, and um, my supervisor is Professor Gadi, and it has been a good ride so far. And I'm just happy that many people who have um, inspired us and we look up to are also part of this book, like um, Professor Alta, whom I've met, and now Professor Helfer, whom um, I'm seeing here for the first time. And I, I can now associate the footnotes and the book titles with the face. 
which is not normally easy. So I'm, I'm, I'm generally sort of uh, happy that this project has come along. For the one minute that I've been given about business actors, my, my research currently is on uh, how business actors and uh, business players are using this court. It's not a neglected area. I think it's a question that needs to be answered appropriately. So you can think about the um, first case that has come out from the ESJ uh, that has been brought by the British American Tobacco. So this just got uh, decided uh, the other day. Uh, and uh, we can see that the, um, stronger business actors, that is a multinational or transnational sort of companies, have started taking interest. And they're taking the cue from what all these other actors you've had uh, being mentioned. And they can see that these courts are important and these courts play an important role. And to see this, the British uh, American Tobacco actually won this case and it was against Uganda. Uh, without going into the merits, you can see that this is getting, it's getting some traction because we have a court, we have a, a company in Tanzania called Kio Limited, which has also sued Tanzania on a similar case and the, in the ESCJ. And these cases are coming up. Uh, where business actors are now starting to see these courts as important players for their various reasons, including the fact that they want to protect their transnational capital. And I find this to be interesting, I've, and I've written about it elsewhere, and I think it's it's um, a nice one. And, and it's on the case commentary that was just released re recently in the African uh, Journal of International Economic Law, which I highly, highly recommend for all of us who are here to read. Uh, it's very, very interesting articles. On this chapter that we wrote with Professor Gavi, in a real sense, it's a navigational tool for anyone who's reading this book. We, are, we have two sections that are important. The first section is just to tell you what are the characteristics of this course. Uh, many of you might be aware that Africa has the largest number of international courts uh, regionally. We have uh, eight which are active and one which is inactive. And even that inactive one, we said something about it, which is the Arab Maghreb Union Court um, or Tribunal. And we, we even struggled with sort of to find out what is the specific name for this, um, for this court. But uh, the more important thing about this court was that uh, we were asking ourselves, why has there been little judicialization or less judicialization in, the, in North Africa? And we present some four reasons that can explain this. I think one of the most interesting is the fact that uh, this um, Northern African countries have been more sort of insular and even outward looking than inward looking into Africa. So you can consider Morocco uh, uh, trying to uh, join the EU, EU, um, EU in 1987 and uh, their bid being rejected. And there are other reasons, including the fact that Morocco has had a lot of problems, for example, with Western Sahara, which has sort of affected the judicialization that is going on there. But we think that this is an important area that still needs to be exploited and, um, you know, more research can be done in that specific area. We also present the important characteristics that all these, um, uh, you know, authors have mentioned about these courts, that they're just not regional integration courts, even if they develop an, a regional integration system. They are election dispute resolution courts. They are international human rights courts. Uh, courts and, and they have very many sort of characteristics, especially a sad before it's being gutted out or it's national attrition, the ESCJ and uh, ECOWAS. But we also present uh, some of the other courts which are mainly economic based and they have maintained the economic disputes within the economic uh, realm, such as, as the OHADA CCJ, which um, is very robust, but mainstream literature has not given it enough attention, or um, the Waimu Court of Justice and the Sema Court of Justice, which are all courts that deal specifically with economic disputes and have had cases that have, are important, uh, both domestically in Central Africa, and in West Africa, and that are important for us to consider and to look at. The other section is to present all of this um, uh, court systematically and to give you an idea of what they are, what is their structure, where they are established, and sort of get an in introduction, a quick introduction to the court. So if you were to read this book and you do not have never, or you do not know about a specific court, before delving into it and you like to know, you know, basic introductory um, sort of reference material, 
this is the chapter to go to. And that, uh, this chapter can help you in terms of uh, thinking about it as a, as a reference tool, just like we have titled it. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, uh, Harrison. Uh, Tom, do you have any reflections? Uh, there's one question, uh, and I'm delighted we have some time, uh, a little time. Do you, do you have any reflections having had the, the authors um, of the various chapters? Uh, you know, what's the downside? What's the future sort of direction you see this research agenda going? Well, that's a great question. I mean, I think the, work, I think the courts, let's be honest, are at a critical juncture, you know. Uh, the backlash point, which Karen and Larry and you have written about, is about sort of, if I can call it sort of mega backlash. But then there's all these, you know, countries that are sort of, uh, you know, pr withdrawing from optional jurisdiction for individuals. Uh, and I just feel like it's kind of the, the direction is not certain. You know, the trajectory is actually not certain. Um, so, I mean, we just have to follow these things. I love the idea of expanding the framework. And I think that one thing the volume has done, which is so good, is the explicitly comparative framework. You know, we really learn a lot when we compare the dynamics in the different parts of Africa. Um, maybe that's all I have to say. I mean, if there's, uh, I'm happy to come back after the questions if there's extra time. Okay. So, uh, speaking about comparative, uh, our good friend Salvatore Cassetta is here who also published last year a great volume. And uh, so before we go to the specific question, I think it's only fair that, uh, you know, he's been here uh, listening very patiently. Maybe he might have some thoughts uh, along those lines. So Salvatore, and congratulations also for your great book as well in the same series. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, James. Uh, and I'll also will be commenting on the, on, uh, on this book on the 4th of February at iCourse. So I don't want to burn all my, uh, all my ideas, but uh, I think to go back to, uh, to your theoretical uh, framework, I think the idea of going beyond uh, compliance and effectiveness, I think it's something that uh, really resonates uh, very well with, uh, with me. And uh, as a scholar of international courts uh, outside Europe, and uh, because uh, in a way, <clears throat> also what uh, I try to do in my book is precisely to show that uh, these international courts, uh, these regional courts, are they belong to a specific context uh, that are uh, inherently different than the European than the European one. Uh, and, and therefore, we need uh, theories and we need approaches that are specifically tailored to, uh, to explore these institutions uh, in their own right. Uh, and even, as you, say, as you also mentioned, considering the political landscape of Europe that is, uh, uh, that is changing uh, uh, in a way uh, European courts actually could, and European scholars of European courts could actually learn a lot from, from a book like yours. Uh, and uh, <laughs> precisely because uh, because of the change political uh, environment, as was also mentioned before. So um, I don't want to, as, as I said, I don't want to burn all my uh, ideas. Uh, but I think this is a great uh, this is a great contribution, and uh, uh, which I really which I really welcome and resonate very well also with my work on international courts in Latin America and the Caribbean. I think so. Uh, thank you so much, Salvatore. That's very kind of you to say that. Uh, we had one question that I've already sent uh, in the chat to Jake, uh, to Obiora Okafor from Caroline Nalule. So, uh, Obi, are you ready to answer that? Uh, uh, the question, uh, do you want to read the question out? Yeah, yes, I am. Yeah. Okay, um, I think the question was, uh, to the effect, uh, myself and Victor, uh, how exactly are we measuring in the impact, the impact of these courts in the broader and real terms that is beyond the emerging jurisprudence? Um, well, first, I want to say that the emerging jurisprudence is real. Um, so I wouldn't bifurcate between the real terms and the uh, emerging jurisprudence. but. But in terms of beyond that, um, <clears throat> this, this, this chapter doesn't do that. So it doesn't necessarily do entirely that. That's why I mentioned 
that there's you know uh, forthcoming papers that are drafted already that are just being honed um, uh, based on you know field work um, that will show you know in detail not of course not discussing every single instance but in detail specific ways in this happens for example good friend friend of mine senior counsel human rights lawyer he would often just file a case he knows he will lose you know he knows he will lose it on a technicality ground if he's dealing with the police the moment the police get served with an echo as caught um echo has caught um um not even an order not even a ruling the request to have you know enter an appearance in court the game changes the terrain changes completely right so people who are detained uh they tell you oh we're not even holding them appear uh in many cases they're released because they don't want the publicity that comes with the echo has caught so it, there's many ways so i'm just giving you one example of the kinds of creative things that these local actors deploy on the ground. So uh, there's many, they're not always the same thing. There's no formula. It's it's creative. What, what, what could work to bring pressure on the relevant agents uh, in particular specific cases, right? Um, um, <clears throat> And so on. So anyway, in some cases, it's hiring Falana, who who happens to be both on the human rights side, but happens to to know the Attorney General, and who actually actually was helping the Attorney General do some human rights reforms. And he, you know, he's the law. He, sorry, the government hires him, right? And then there's a, there's a settlement. So you know, there's all kinds of uh, different ways in which you know, the, the court tends to have value, right? In some ways, in sometimes it's reinforcing uh, the National Human Rights Commission's, uh, uh, you know, uh, decisions. Anyway, uh, so uh, stay tuned. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so great. Um, so we are running out of time now, and I hate to end this conversation, uh, but if there is one last minute thought, uh, we can entertain it before we close. Since I don't want to preempt anybody who wanted to either ask a question or make a comment, um, especially somebody who has not spoken. Okay, uh, not even Tomas. All right. Um, so anyway, I think um, I think this has been a good discussion, and I do really thank the authors uh, for uh, their patience. Of uh, I think BC said it was 2016 when we met. <laughs> uh, it's been a long time in the making. And that question that Caroline asked about the impact was the discussion when we met in 2016. You know, what is impact? How do you sort of think about impact? How do you uh, design a project like Obi was saying that uh, tries to um, understand uh, all the things that go into deciding whether to litigate uh, and the consequences that may not be obvious if you're looking at the role of litigation beyond simply uh, the fact whether governments eventually do comply. And and this book doesn't make the case that compliance is not important. Uh, that's not the point. In fact, activists and litigants would be very happy if there was compliance, but they also do understand the highly authoritarian nature of the regimes that they're dealing with. Uh, but they're often able to bring these governments uh, in a forum like uh, one of the authors said, that the government doesn't control. And, and that is when, as Obi says, things begin changing, the real circumstances on behalf uh, on the things or people on behalf of which is being litigated, uh, the things begin to change. And capturing that uh, set of issues is what this book has tried to begin to do. And I encourage other people that uh, have projects along these lines that they should take them forward because this book only, in my view, scratches the, the surface. 
I already, like I think somebody said the Benin case, I think it was you, BC. I mean, there's so many examples that, uh, uh, that lay the basis for future work that would challenge this book uh, and take this work further. And I hope that uh, it's not just going to be, you know, um, the work that people like Salvatore are going to do. I know that our good friend uh, in the Caribbean, uh, Jan Remy, uh, is also uh, working uh, along these lines. And there are many others that I don't know, of course. Uh, but I do hope that people engage with the ideas in the book. Uh, and I thank everybody for coming today, and in particular the authors, and for really being very patient. Uh, I know that OUP has said that there have been some shipping issues because of the pandemic with the book. So unfortunately, not everybody who has purchased, this, purchased it is able to uh, get a copy right away. Uh, but uh, I, I know if you look at the announcements that we've been making uh, for this session, that OUP has a flyer for a discount. So if uh, you'd be interested in taking advantage of that, 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 that would be great. So I think we formally will end. Uh, you know, I'll stay on uh, to informally chat with anybody who wants to chat, especially Salvatore, if he wants to disclose everything in advance of the meeting in February. Uh, so I do thank everybody really from the bottom of my heart. This has been um, a, a progress, a work in progress for a long time, and I'm glad to have had the best company to really sort of think aloud and to put this in writing and, and to see it in print. So I, I really appreciate everybody's support tremendously. So Asante Sana, as we'd say in, uh, in Kenya, thank you very much.